Did you bring your copy of God's Word with you today? All right, turn with me, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We are starting a new series today. It's called Until Everyone Hears. Until Everyone Hears. And it's going to take us to launch Sunday, which is the first Sunday after Labor Day, uh, September the 8th, when we resume our connect groups and we and we uh, go to two services in a couple of our locations and just so excited about that um, this series is on evangelism and it's based on second peter chapter 3 verse 9 second peter chapter 3 verse 9 begins the lord isn't really slow about his promise as some people think well, what promise is that? What promise are we talking about? Well, Jesus promised to return in his second coming. He promised to do away with the current heaven and earth. He promised to restore all things and create a new heaven and earth. And he promised that all of us who are, who are his devoted followers are going to be able to reign with him throughout all of eternity. That's his promise. That's what we're holding out for. And so... God's going to do this, but the text also says that Jesus, some people think that Jesus is slow about fulfilling that promise, and you can't really blame him. I mean, it's been 2,000 years already, and he still hasn't come back. Come on, Jesus, when are you going to come? I mean, we're waiting. Are you going to be in my lifetime or, or, or what? And I remember when I was in, um, in high school, I uh, senior year in high school, I already was signed up to to uh, enrolled in college and uh, in Missouri. And uh, we had a guest speaker come and he preached on the second coming. He preached on the rapture. He preached as if Jesus was coming tonight. And I distinctly remember, who's got time to go to college, man? We got to get ready for Jesus to come. And I, I, I went to the church that I'm going to work at the church. I'm not going to go to college. I went to college later. But, uh, you know, we used to, we, 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 we used to just hold out for Jesus coming today, Jesus coming today. And, and, uh, and so when he doesn't, you think, okay, well, maybe he's not coming. And, and so but this verse changes our perspective. This verse changes our perspective. It continues, no, Jesus is not slow. No, he's being patient for your sake. There's a difference between patience and mercy and being slow and negligent. And we serve a God who is patient. We serve a God who is merciful. Look at what it continues to say. Jesus does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. What does Jesus want? He wants everyone to repent of their sins, accept him in their heart, and to follow him, and to be spared from eternal judgment, and to have eternal life. That's what Jesus wants so passionately. He doesn't want any, he doesn't want to come back until everyone has heard what this series is about. The good news, having eternal life by putting our faith in Jesus. Here's the question. Here's the question. Do we want what Jesus wants? I mean, after all, we tell people we're followers of Jesus. Are we really following Jesus? Jesus if we don't want what he wants or we don't care about what he wants. Jesus cares most about as many people coming to faith in him as possible. Is that what we want? So we're going to talk about that for the next few weeks. Wanting what Jesus wants. Does our developing, cultivating a passion, a burning in our heart to, to go after what Jesus' heart's burning for. After all, if we're his followers, shouldn't we be concerned about what he's concerned about? Reaching those who are lost, being that bridge. I, uh, we've got a couple in our church that just has, has modeled this so wonderfully for us. I'd like to invite uh, Pat and Jen Coglin to come out at this time and, and join me here in the frame. And uh, would you just give a hand to Pat and Jen? We're talking about evangelism. We're talking about accepting responsibility to share our faith 
with other people who, who, who have it. And you guys started a ministry. You're one of our Kingdom Builder partners, by the way. We have a number of partners that go to our church, and you guys are one of our Kingdom Builder partners. You, you, you bought and built out a, a, a food truck called Cup of Kindness. You go and serve free coffee, but then you offer free prayers for people. And yesterday, you took a team from our church. You went down to Virginia Beach, right on the boardwalk. Talk to us, Jen. What, what happened yesterday? Good morning, Cause Love family. Uh, let's get uh, you turned on here. Okay. We had an amazing day yesterday. Uh, thanks. Shout out to Kenny and Michelle. We couldn't do Cup of Kindness without them. But we, had, uh, we served 350 cups of coffee, prayed for over 300 people, for salvation, for encouragement, for healing. We saw 28 souls come into the kingdom of heaven yesterday. <laughs> wow. It was so awesome. It was so awesome because, and I want you to enjoy this and to know the thrill of this. And so yesterday there were so many more. The tragic is there are so many more that we could have prayed for, that we could have led to the Lord. But we need help. <laughs> we need people to come and help us do Cup of Kindness and see uh, the kingdom of heaven, of heaven populated. You are plundering hell and populating heaven. Yes, sir. Wow, that's exciting. <laughs> we need more people to join your team. We need lots more people yeah. to join our okay. team. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, Pat, uh, God has opened up tremendous doors for you going down to Costa Rica. Uh, talk to yes. us a little bit about what's happening in Costa Rica. A miracle took place. I was in, we were in Costa Rica preaching into the school systems. Thousands and thousands of people were getting saved. And then I got a call from the parliament, the government, they wanted to come and see me. At first, I thought, oh, am I in trouble? And then I got there, and they had a big committee. They said, we heard what you all been doing to the schools, that our school systems need this message. And they begged me, literally begged, can you take this message to our school system? Not only to, to a few schools, to all Costa Rica, to every single school in Costa Rica. <laughs> 4,000 schools, over a million people. And I said, yes, I will. But I'm gonna need a lot of help. I'm gonna need help from you guys and Mark to come. So they took me from that place and they brought me to the TV station. The little I knew I was, it was going to go happen. And they said, we're going to put you on live. We're going to endorse this all over Costa Rica. So over a half million people I heard the gospel and what we're going to do in Costa Rica. And they liked the message so much they said, Pat, this station is now your station. I want you to come bring your pastor I want you to come and I want you to speak. And you can speak to us anytime what's going on or you have a message. And there's another TV station that God has, uh, told us that they already asked us to come. And that's going to go out to five other countries. Millions and millions of people that hear the gospel. We're talking about millions getting saved. <laughs> but we need your help. And the Lord spoke to me down here because we're going to train those who want to go into schools because we need a train. And God spoke to me. Some of you young people, in one week you'll see thousands of people get saved. Mm -hmm. Some of you will love it so much you'll come back again. You'll see tens of thousands of people get saved. God spoke that in our church there's going to be people in here. They'll lead tens of thousands of people to get saved. And then the pastors in the city are crying out for help. And they need people as far as uh, uh, as far as pastor gatherings. And I need this guy here to come help me when I preaching and evangelizing and gathering all even the cities and in the schools. I need pa pa Pastor Mark to come to speak. And so all these pastors, large churches on Costa Rica are seeking us out. It says, Pat, will you come? Will you come? I just don't have time for all of it. So we're going to have a lot of work to do. We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> Oh, bless you. You got a preach in you, man. But it's my turn today. <laughs> we'll get you another time. All right. Well, Jen, how does this make you feel as a, as a person that just goes out and shares your faith and sees people accept Same. Jesus? Yeah. 
So I just want to encourage you, there is nothing like it in the whole world. There's nothing as thrilling or as exciting as seeing someone come into the kingdom of God. And if you've not led somebody to the Lord, you're missing out. It is addictive. It is absolutely addictive. Your soul will never know the amazing joy that you could know by building up the kingdom of God and offering salvation to another person. Amen. Okay. All right. <laughs> Bless you guys. Here, you want to take this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, you heard it right from them, and there's more people. You know, we all have the responsibility to share our faith. Some people, like Pat and Jen, are gifted, but we all have the responsibility. And we need to cultivate that gift in, in all of us and cultivate that responsibility. And, um, and we're just so excited about being able to, to tackle this, this new series together. Uh, we, Jesus, Jesus told us we, we, we have to own this. We, God's plan is that he would die on the cross for our sins, but his, also his plan includes partnering with us to go and share that good news that people can accept that arrangement and have eternal life. We are God's plan A. There is no plan B. And so we feel that responsibility. We have, to, uh, we have to remember our own story and what Jesus has done at transforming our lives and then invite other people that we know that we have a relationship with to, to experience that transformation in their own life as we, as we model that. And so our location pastors are going to be speaking in the next uh, few weeks about this about uh, breaking down 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, and what that means, sharing how, uh, teaching us how do we share our faith, how do we have confidence that we, we, we know what's, what Jesus is, is, has done and, and be able to convince someone else of that. And so I really want you to be here uh, for this series. But uh, for today, for today, we're going to look at the foundation of it all, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 16 together. Verse 16 says, don't you realize that all of you, all of you are the temple of God and that the spirit of God lives in you. Wow. The emphasis here is, is we are carriers of the presence of God. We are carriers of the presence of God. And the presence of God is so powerful. He is the all-powerful creator of the universe. You cannot come in contact with all-powerful God and not walk away unchanged. You just, you, you just, it just it's transformational. And so uh, in our text today, in our text today, Paul draws upon an Old Testament concept, brings it into the new covenant, and, and provides application for us. He says, he says, we are temples. We are temples. Now, that is a strange analogy. And so we need to, uh, anytime the New Testament draws upon an Old Testament concept, we need to go back to that, see it in the physical realm, study it, and then make application to the spiritual realm, which is unseen and a little bit more difficult to comprehend in the New Testament. And so let's do that. How does the Old Testament physical temple, Solomon's temple, inform us on how we are to be God's temple today. That's where we're headed. And so let's share some a little bit of background first. Um, uh, for millennia, humanity could not have a relationship with God. They didn't have any interaction with God. Uh, the interaction with God was very scarce. People knew about God, but they did not know him personally like you can know him today. Now, there were some rare occasions like the burning bush or, or the fourth person in the fiery furnace, but you could count on two hands uh, the number of times in the Old Testament throughout a couple of thousand years of God actually interacting face-to-face -face with somebody uh, here on earth. Uh, divine encounters were like the lottery. You just had to be in the right place at the right time, and it was very, very rare. But then God, uh, God laid it upon da King David's heart to build him a house where God could dwell on earth. 
uh, for up to this point, God existed in the remote parts of heaven, and people didn't get a chance to know him. They only knew about him. And so God laid it on King David's heart. King David uh, designed the, the temple. He, uh, he raised the funds for it. And, and then he handed the blueprints off to his son Solomon. And King Solomon succeeded in building the temple. And up to this point, it was literally unclear what the purpose of this temple was. They were just acting out of obedience because God said do it. But it was at the dedication of the temple that we finally hear the purpose of why this temple, this physical structure existed. And it's in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. God is talking. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, uh, verse 15. He said, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. So up to this point, it hadn't been. But now it's changed. For now, I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. So what we see here is finally after so many years, centuries and centuries, now there's finally a junction between divinity and humanity, between the sacred and the profane, between God and people. There's a junction, there's a meeting place where God's presence can be encountered. And it was inside the temple. Now, it was still limited under the Old Covenant. For the rest of the Old Testament, still a, a, a limited. God's presence was restricted to the inner sanctuary, and uh, the priests did their activity in the outer sanctuary once a year on Yom Kippur, which is coming up in this October. Um, they would go in behind the veil, and they would they would experience the presence of God face to face. They would talk to God. God would talk to them, and then they would come back out from from that inner sanctuary and tell the people what God said. I mean, that was as good as it could get for the old covenant. But it was a lot better than what it had been. Suffice it to say, the Old Testament was a dwelling place for the presence of God. The, the, the temple was a dwelling place for the presence of God. In verses 1 and 2 of 2 Chronicles 7, uh, a little earlier in that passage, the Shekinah glory of God came and filled the temple on that dedication day. The, 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 the uh, cloud was so thick and the fire was so bright that, that the priests could not do their sacred little duties. The presence of God was there and, 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 and the mighty power of God was, was there that humanity could experience and they could be transformed by it. So, how does this Old Testament physical temple, how does that inform the New Testament? How does that physical temple inform us living under the New Covenant in the spiritual realm? How does that inform us when, when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 3 that we are the now the temple? Your heart is the temple. How does that, how does that work? Well, we see it here in verse 16. Don't you realize that you're a temple of God? Here it is. And that the Spirit of God lives in you. The Spirit of God lives in you. Just Oh, God still lives in temples today, but not an old structure of brick and mortar that is restricted to one place. God still lives in temples, but he lives in our hearts now. He lives in our hearts, and so... God's not restricted to just one place and one structure. He is in the hearts of every believer around the world. And we are carriers of God's presence. We contain the presence of God. Just like the Old Testament temple contained the presence of God, we contain the presence of God. We are carriers of God's presence. Everywhere we go, God goes. Every person that we come encounter in touch with, God comes in touch with. And let me just tell you, God is so powerful, you cannot come into the presence of God and not be changed. The question is, are we carrying that presence to other people who have not encountered God yet? Are we carrying that presence to them? The lost 
have an opportunity to encounter God because of us. We are the carriers of the presence of God to those who do not know God yet. Now, uh, let me just illustrate when I say that we come into the presence of the power of God. And I want to just tell you, you're not the one powerful. Okay, you're just the conduit. You're just the little wire that carries the power, okay, from the source to the recipient. When, uh, when I was a kid, I was probably about six years old, and I was visiting my grandparents, and my grandfather was a mechanic, and he was also a prankster. And he was out mowing the yard, and I was out watching him, and he said, come on over here, son, I want to show you something. And he, he, said, he, he stooped down, and and he touched my earlobe, and then he touched the spark plug of the running lawnmower. And as soon as his fingers touched the spark plug of the running lawnmower, a jolt went in me, and I was shaking, and my hair was sticking up. You could probably charge him for a child abuse. My hair was sticking up, and he, he let go right quick, and, but, but my, the blood in my veins was tingling. My skin was tingling. My hair was thinning. up. I was shaking, and, and it was a wake-up call, and he laughed and laughed and laughed. He thought that was so funny. Come to find out, he did it to my dad and all my uncles when they were growing up. But, uh, but, but I, I share that story with you because... When you met my grandfather and shook his hand in the street, there was no power. There was no electrical shock. He didn't carry shock around. He didn't, he, he didn't, he was not the source of that. The lawnmower was the source of the power. Okay? He just touched the source of the power and connected it to the recipient. And the power went through him. But there was nothing about him. It was all the lawnmower. Okay? He was just the conduit. Let me just remind you that as a carrier of the powerful presence of God, you're nothing. You're just the conduit. You're just the person that connects the power to the recipient. That's what God wants you to do. But when that happens, they can't walk away unchanged. A few years ago, I was uh, invited to speak at a conference, a pastor's conference in Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a former communist country in Eastern Europe. And uh, I was invited to preach there. And, and there was a conference about 300 pastors from all over the country. And they only saw each other about once a year at this conference. So it was a big reunion. And, you know, 300 pastors, we rented out the whole um, uh, hotel. It was exclusively ours. And I was the guest speaker for uh, about three nights, and and uh, and it was just gonna, it was just a really great time. They brought in a Bulgarian worship team from one of the churches, and man, that first night it was awesome. It was loud. It was raucous. Man, they were worshiping God. They were jumping and dancing and going crazy, and and and, and it was just amazing to watch these Bulgarian pastors just be so excited to be in the presence of Jesus and, and to be with each other. And we made a lot of noise. It was so much fun. And then after the service was all over, we're all going to our rooms, going to bed, the management of the hotel called our conference coordinator and said, look, you guys can still meet here tomorrow night, but you're not allowed to turn on the electricity and have your sound system." And we said, wait a minute. No, we had an agreement. We rented this sound system. We have a service. You can't have a charismatic service without a power, without a sound system. You know, I don't know how Jesus did it, but, but, but anyway. So uh, we, were, we, we really were angry. We were appealing. We was like, why, 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 why? You know, we rented this place. This is our place. They said, well, we didn't tell you, but there's an executive floor here that is not accessible by everybody else and that we have 12 Egyptian businessmen who are here in Sofia investigating how to invest in some businesses and uh, they complain because it just goes against their Muslim faith and so we need to respect their wishes and you can't have a sound system you gotta meet and so that first night was awful I mean, we were trying to have a, 
a service with 300 pastors and there's no amplification. You can't hear the guitar. You can't, hear, can't play the piano because it was electric. I mean, we, we couldn't do anything. And, and, and people started singing their own songs out and hoping everybody else would join them. Anyway, we, we lost control. It was awful. It was a mess. I was yelling. I couldn't, didn't have a microphone. I was trying to yell the message. Nobody responded. It was awful. And I was frustrated. We went uh, out after the service. This is the second night. We went out after the service to a, a, a restaurant next door, and we're having a debrief. And we're, we, we started talking about the, the conference next year and how they wanted me to come back and, and, uh, and let's get a different venue and let's make sure there's no Egyptian Muslims around. And, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's go for it. And so... Um, and so we were there, and we were all frustrated, but we're planning next year. And I remember, oh, I don't have my phone. I don't have my camera, my, my, uh, my calendar. i got to run back and get my calendar. And so it was just next door. So I ran out of the restaurant. There's about six leaders that are waiting. And so I'm in a hurry. I'm running to the hotel, going to run through the, the, the lobby, run upstairs, grab my phone, get back, and, and then resume the meeting. That was the plan. Well, when I ran through... The lobby, these 12 Egyptian businessmen were gathered there. I, I got to tell you, I didn't have a good attitude toward them. I didn't feel like being nice. I was angry. Oh, you ruined our meeting. And so, you entitled, spoiled brats. And so, so I, I'm just running past them. And they, and they reached out and said, hey, 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 hey. And there's one guy that spoke English. He was the interpreter for all of them. He said, hey, we got a question. You're Christians, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in a hurry, yeah. And, and, and he says, well, so you, you believe Jesus heals, right? Said, yeah, yeah, I do, I do, yeah, I got to go. Well, our boss here has a problem with his neck, and I looked at his neck, and he had a big gourd on the back of his neck, about the size of a half of a grapefruit. Just imagine cutting a grapefruit in half and putting it on the back of your neck, and that's what he had. And, uh, and, and, and the tr interpreter said, do you think Jesus could heal this? Oh, now I'm really ticked. <laughs> so, oh, you're not only going to shut us down, now you're going to mock us. Now you're going to dare us to heal in front of everybody. Okay. And, 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 and he said, do you th would, you, would you ask Jesus to heal him right now? And, and I got to tell you, I was not in a good place. I'm honest. I was angry at these guys. And, uh, and, and, and another thing, I, I've been in ministry a long time, and I pray for people here in America, and, and, you know, God didn't heal them. Has that ever happened to you? Have you ever prayed for something God didn't answer the way you wanted them to answer? Is that, am, am I the only one? Okay. So, and I'm saying, okay, okay. And so I knew they didn't speak English, and so I'm having a gut-level prayer with Jesus, me and Jesus, and I know he hears me. I said, Jesus... Tomorrow, I'm going to get on an airplane. Uh, two days, I'm going to get on an airplane. And I'm going to go back to America. I'm not going to see these guys anymore. So they don't know who I am. They don't know my name. They don't know where I'm from. I'm, I'm going to leave. They'll never see me again. My reputation is not on the line here. Jesus, your reputation is on the line. If you decide not to heal here like you've done a lot of times back where I'm from, uh, then this is on you, Jesus. You'll have to explain to them why he still has his gourd when he gets on his plane. And I said, amen, amen. And I ran off, got my phone, ran back through the, air, the, the, uh, the lobby, and they're all still there. And I run back over the, to the, to the uh, restaurant. We have our meeting. We plan the next year. Everything's good. We come back. We're walking slow. We're talking about everything. And we get to the lobby and it's noisy there's a ruckus in the lobby that competes with the ruckus we had the first night in our conference and these 12 businessmen from Egypt are going crazy they're just ecstatic and we walk in and they run over and they're hugging us and look 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 and the man's neck was as clean as no gourd totally totally healed I was shocked. And, 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 and they said, hey, please, through the interpreter, please, would you please come and join us for breakfast in the morning? 
And we want to hear more. See, the Bible says in Hebrews 4, 2, that God confirms his message with signs and wonders. It wasn't just my words now. We had a sign and a wonder. And they wanted to know more. And so the next morning, I got up and I went to the executive floor. Now, I want to tell you, we were low budget for our conference. These pastors didn't have a lot of money. We were having cold cucumber soup with diluted milk for breakfast. That was our breakfast. I get to the executive floor where the 12 Egyptian businessmen are, and man, it was a spread. I was like, whoa, we don't have anything like this in America. This is amazing. And they said, come join us. Put me at the head of the table. I was eating like a crazy guy. Man, it was awesome. And they wanted, for two hours, they wanted to hear more about Jesus. And every one of them gave their life to Jesus that morning. They said, hey, we'll talk to the management. You can have your sound system back. Y'all can have your service with, with one caveat. Would you please reserve the front row for us? We want to come to your service. And I'm thinking, man, these guys are still entitled. They don't want to just come. They want to sit in the front row. That night we had a service. It was so funny watching these 12 Egyptian businessmen. They didn't speak Bulgarian. They couldn't know, didn't know the songs. They'd just known Jesus for 12 hours. And they were dancing and carrying on in the front row, going on with the music, laughing and high-fiving each other. They were enjoying Jesus. I tell you that story to let you know, it wasn't about me. I don't have any power. All I know is, is that I'm in touch with the source of the power, Jesus Christ, and I just reached up and I touched a hungry soul that wanted Jesus. And the power of God transformed his life, healed him, and all of his, his buddies got healed, and they wanted to serve Jesus. That's what I'm talking about. We are the carriers of the presence of God. We're the carriers of the presence of God. I'd like to invite you all to stand across all of our locations. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. I want to ask a question to all of you who are believers, followers of Jesus. How many of you know somebody that doesn't know Jesus yet? Can I just see your hand? Look around. We all know somebody that doesn't know Jesus. How many of you would say, Pastor, I want to be a carrier of the presence of God? I'm not, it's not about me and my intellect and my heart for anything. If, if God could use you in Bulgaria, maybe he could use me. You say, I want to be used of God. I just want to be a conduit. I don't need to know all the things I need to know. I just, I know Jesus lives in me and I want to take Jesus to those who don't know him and I want him to flow through me and touch people and transform lives like he's transformed me. If that's you, and I want to pray. I want to pray for you right now. If that's you, can I just see your hand? Look at that. We're a hand raising church all across our locations. Let's pray right now. I want to pray for you right now. Lord Jesus, you see a hungry people inspired by Pat and Jen's testimony. We all are carriers of your presence. We work in a field that's white with harvest. You're asking for more workers. You're seeking us. God, I pray your anointing rest upon my friends. I pray that as the carrier of, their, of your presence, you go with them. And as they encounter other people, as they touch other people, the power of God will touch their lives. In Jesus' name, would you say amen? Amen.